Hi, thank you for joining me. I'm Mindy Mandel, and I do have a video for you this week. It's me reading The Republic with Jacob and Jed. I will give you that in a moment. Um, it's thanks to Jed, by the way, that we do have this video. My video got corrupted. Long story, don't, don't go into that. But anyway, he did make a backup, and so that's what we'll be seeing. So we're going to pick up the video from where, where we're going back into the text. And we're going into courage. So just as a reminder, the week before, we did start looking at the virtues. We looked at wisdom, and we started courage. But in the discussion of courage, there was an analogy of dying wool as a comparison to courage. And that required a bit of opening up. So we're going back through it again. We're going to read that section again. So I do hope that you enjoy the video. And without further ado, here we go. What I'd like to do now, then, is to reread, then, this section where he introduces the analogy. Because, because this is, well, I think we need to just have it fresh in our minds, and then we can go back and take a look at all the pieces. Now, last time, we did pull out the different pieces, that there are the dyers, there's the wool, um, the one nature of the white, the preparatory treatment, the dye itself, the lyes or the soaps, and also the idea of being fast colored. Okay, we want to see how they're all functioning. Okay, so again, um, it preserves the whatever this quality is that we're calling bravery. It's a state of mind that preserves the conviction that things to be feared are precisely those which and such as the lawgiver inculcated in their education. And what sort of conservation are we talking about? The conservation of the conviction which the law has created by education about fearful things. What and what sort of things are to be feared? And we have to preserve this conviction, both in pain and pleasure, and in desires and fears. So to help open this up, we have here this analogy. So Jacob, you've been a very good Socrates throughout. So if you are willing, would you please read it again? Starting from a... Uh... Starting from, I'm sorry, you are aware. At the very top of the page. Top Which page? of page 355. It's in the PDF, it would be screen 371. You are aware that dyers, when they wish to dye wool so as to hold the purple hue, begin by selecting from the many colors there be the one nature of the white and then give it a careful preparatory treatment so that it will take the hue in the best way and after the treatment then and then only dip it in the dye and things that are dyed by this process become fast colored and washing either with or without lies cannot take away the sheen of their hues. But otherwise, you know what happens to them, whether anyone dips other colors or even these without the preparatory treatment. I know that they present a ridiculous and wash out appearance. By this analogy, then, you must conceive what we too, to the best of our ability, were doing when we selected our soldiers and educated them in music and exercises of the body. The sole aim of our contrivance was that they should be convinced and receive our laws like a die, as it were, so that their belief and faith might be fast colored both about the things that are to be feared and all other things because of the fitness of their nature and nurture and that so their dyes might not be washed out by those lies that have such dread power to scour our faiths away 
pleasure more potent than any detergent or abstringent to accomplish this, and pain and fear and desire more sure than any lie. This power in the soul, then, this unfailing conservation of right and lawful belief about things to be and not to be feared, is what I call and would assume to be courage, unless you have something different to say. No, nothing. For I presume that you consider mere right opinion about the same matters not produced by education that will that which may manifest itself in a beast or a slave, to have little or nothing to do with law, and that you would call it by another name than courage. That is most true. Well then, I accept this as bravery. Do so, and you will be right with the reservation that it is the courage of a citizen. Some other time, if it please you, we will discuss it more fully. At present, we were not seeking this, but justice. And for the purpose of that inquiry, I believe we have done enough. You are quite right. Okay. Okay, so now let's go back, then to page 355 and see if we can open all of this up. Okay, so we know that the dyers, that's us working on ourselves. What is the wool? I think we agreed last time. We, we saw this one. It is the soul. The soul. Good. The one nature of the white. Purification. Possibly, yeah, although there is a preparatory treatment mm. as well. Um, for this one, I'm going to suggest um, coming back. I'm going back now all the way to 409. There's a section like 409A through E, like all of 409, where this was in the section on gymnastics where he talked about a good judge and he described it as, and this is um, page 285 for those using the lobe and it's 409B or so. Um, it's 301 in the PDF. And he describes here that a good judge, he would prefer it to be an old man, a late learner of the nature of injustice one who has not become aware of it as a property of his own soul, but one who has, through long years, trained himself to understand injustice as an alien thing in alien souls, and to discern how great an evil it is by the instrument of mere knowledge and not by his own experience. And then at the bottom of the page, um, just to add to this, Socrates says that badness can never come to know both virtue and itself. But native virtue through education will at last acquire the science of both itself and badness. And we saw that also with music, that um, you come to know, as you come to know your own nature, um, you also come to know its opposites as well. And so I point that out. Let me come back to where we were before. Oh, that was council coming back. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so that um, because they want to start ideally with this pure kind of soul. Okay, so I think that's what he means by the nature of the white, that that's the ideal candidate. Okay, you're starting with that. And then you have this preparatory treatment. What is the treatment that we are, we've just, according to this text, what have we just, we just went through a certain kind of education to prepare the soul. What was that education? Music and gymnastics. Yes, exactly. So you have that pure soul, and then you apply music and gymnastics to it. And now there's as purified as can be, right? You can't return to white unless you started there, 
right? So we all actually have this pure soul. Um, and then we, we apply music and gymnastics to it. And then there's the dye. You dip it in the dyes. This is Education, nurture. Mm. We want to be a little more specific. What do we, when we're doing music and gymnastics, it's all built on a certain foundation. There's a certain truth that we have to, we have to have our eye on truth, right? So that we not can sure. recognize what is not true as we're going through our studies of is music. That, if you don't, hmm? Is it that about the gods that they're always good and always yes. the same? Exactly. Yes. Right. But that's what we have to hold on to. There were the two laws that God is good in reality and that God does not change shape or try to deceive us. And if we hold on to that, then we will become fast colored, as he's putting it here. Um, now, the lies, I think that is easy. That's probably the easiest part here. Maybe the wool and the lies, I think, are the easiest, because he actually painted it for us. He said it very clearly. He spelled it out very clearly on the next page. Um, starting actually from the bottom of 355. The dyes might not be washed out by those lies that have such dread power to scour our faiths away. Pleasure more potent than any detergent or astringent to accomplish this and pain and fear and desire more sure than any lie. And so we see that the soaps that he's talking about here are pleasure, pain, fear, and desire. Right. And if we've done this preparatory treatment, we, we, we start with a right opinion about the laws. But then as we go through, as we go through music and gymnastics, as we um, get a sure footing in it and understanding, at least going from right opinion to understanding, we may get some degree of knowing, but even before that, the laws have taken hold. Once you have a good understanding of them, why they must be true. Now, the wool has been dyed. And we see that it will now be fast colored. Um, and this is really where we get into the idea of where courage really fits in here, that they become fast colored because now you have this conservation. Now let's go back to this definition, actually, at the end of the section here. This power in the soul, this unfailing conservation of right and lawful belief. It's fast colored. You're holding it tight. This belief about things to be and not to be feared. If you know that God is good and you know that God will not deceive you, you know what is most important. You're going to hold on to that. And you're not going to be distracted by pleasures that take you in another direction. Um, you're not going to be daydreaming about your desires of going into the future. Um, you're not going to be distracted by pain. Your heartache or physical pain is not going to distract you from holding on to this. You're not going to waver in your belief that God is good and that God will not deceive you. And you will also not be distracted by fear of something happening in the future. Okay, so as we develop, um, and also our understanding of what we are is going to keep changing, of course, as we move along. And so our understanding of courage, of what it means to be courageous, is going to be different at each stage, if you will. When you see yourself as a physical being, courage has one meaning. When you see yourself as like a, a being that has a soul versus um, a soul that has a body versus um, that which, you know, continues to reincarnate and maybe eventually you identify as soul in a greater sense, right? So your understanding of courage is going to keep maturing and developing how exactly it applies to your life. But this is the basic definition that we're working with here. Okay, so here we're looking at courage as an element in the soul. Notice at the bottom here, he says that, um, where was it? Um, 
It is courage of a citizen. Some other time we'll discuss it more fully. Okay, so it will develop and mature as we go along, but this is where he's at now. We're looking at ourselves more as like maybe a person who's, uh, whose essence is soul that reincarnates. And in this sense, this is how it's going to function in our lives. Is this clear? Any questions? Any confusion? Anything you want to open up more? I liked how we mentioned last time about uh, pleasure that he like had singled it out as mm -hmm. uh, with like the detergent uh, kind mm -hmm. of analogy, but right. then had the other three as the the lies or the soap, mm -hmm. and that because it's when you're experiencing like pain, fear, or desire, mm -hmm. you might be able to recognize it's mm -hmm. like having a detrimental effect on you but that with mm -hmm. pleasure it's more mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. you know <laughs> yes it's confusing stronger. or it's yeah. stronger yeah 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 absolutely uh, yeah right. that's a good point that when you're in pain <clears throat> you can feel that something's not working in my life but when things are going well you're winning at the casino or um you're head over heels in love with someone you just met and totally infatuated, you're, you're feeling pleasure. Um, and you're feeling like life is great. And so, yeah, it's very easy then to put those laws aside and to not be thinking about yourself as a soul. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, when people are going through hardships, sometimes that's, um, the cynical view of religion is that's when people become religious. Uh, yeah. Right. That is. But to truly um, to truly develop one's spirituality, to go into it in the more mature way that we're looking to do it, you have to, your life has to be at a, it really helps to have your life in a fairly stable place. Right. So, um, we find that it's not when you're in pain that you are most religious. The truly spiritual person um, will maintain that state of mind regardless of good or bad ups and downs in life. Okay, so so far we have two then of the um, of the virtues. Oh yeah, and by the way, we saw um, faith mentioned at the bottom of page 355 and then again at the top of 357 okay but it's not the faith in like the biblical sense okay um okay so now we've seen two then of the virtues so we saw that wisdom is the smallest part of the soul but it's what leads the soul and then you have courage this conservation this steadfastness that holds the dyes in place, if you will. And so you can see, you can start to see, I think, that wisdom and courage work together. There are two different aspects that he's acknowledged, that he's recognizing in the soul, but they work together. Okay. Um, the next section then is temperance. Um, he's calling it here soberness and this is section eight it starts on the bottom of page 357 here he's translating it as soberness this is sophrosun in greek um, sometimes translated as temperance or sound mindedness uh, moderation is another one i've seen in some translations so there are many ways to translate it okay but it's all the greek sophrosun okay we ready to move on or any what was what did we decide was the the die? What makes it steadfast within us all? Uh, the die are the laws, and they become steadfast through courage, through holding tight to this throughout all of life's experiences. So, like a repetition of a belief that you carry throughout your life, like a mantra. Do you think that's what courage is? 
I, I, I'm not, I want to find out what Plato thinks courage is. Well, it's right here. What, what, I'm not quite clear on what your question Well, we, we talked about the, clear about a mantra. We talked about the clearing away to make mm -hmm. the soul pure, which would be a removing of the false beliefs, like the, mm -hmm. the lie, fundamentally the lie about self-reality mm -hmm. being other than good, simple, and true. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But then we talked about uh, the the laws that we can then put into the soul, and we want it to be steadfast. You're and it, you're not going to. So in Platonism, knowledge is not something that's put into you. Wisdom is not put in. Remember the theory of recollection, the idea that our soul already is wise. And so it... it it comes out more more um, surely as we clear away what is false. And so as we clear away what is false through music and gymnastics, those laws that God is good and that God will never deceive us or change shape, that is the dye that takes hold of us. That, that's, the, that's the dye. And so this, the fast coloring is like the courage that holds on to that, that won't let it, it won't clear away, it won't wash away. So when we purify our soul of the false beliefs, mm -hmm. wisdom mm -hmm. naturally emerges. We're not putting a die in through faith or a belief that we have to hold on to. We remember the reality. Mm -hmm. I see where you're going. Yeah. Yeah. In this analogy, it's not perfect, but what he's saying here is that you start with a fairly pure, you start with a pure soul and you go through music and gymnastics. And then because of these practices, the laws become, they, they take hold of you more fully because in our everyday society, I understand where you're coming from and it's not a perfect analogy. You're right. But, um, in our society, it's very easy to be distracted by pleasures or pains by everyday life. But the laws, we have to hold on to them like a like wool holding on to a dye. And that starts with a belief. It starts, it, it starts as right opinion. Yes, so that's belief. Right. So mm -hmm. the practice that he's talking about would be mm -hmm. in the ups and downs of our everyday life. Mm -hmm. Hold on to this belief that you don't yet have as wisdom, but you mm -hmm. expect will one day come from your soul as a remembering mm -hmm. as wisdom. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a holding on of a belief through the ups and downs. Is that right so far? It certainly starts that way. I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. and Although so, I think even early on, you have this an intuitive sense that there's something right about this you wouldn't hold on to this if you didn't you wouldn't be a platonist if you didn't feel there was something if it's if you didn't feel drawn to this right so there has to be something about these guys telling you this belief that makes you think they're worth listening to um i mean it's interesting that it starts with a belief so the way that we um diet we we keep the uh belief steadfast in as pure a soul as we can is it like a repeating of that belief like a mantra so that because if we don't yet have it as a way of seeing we're not yet enlightened we don't see god yet but through courage we have to you know stay on track is he saying that we have to repeat this belief as a kind of mantra so that we don't get distracted no, I don't see that anywhere here. I think in actual practice, what you'll find is that the preparatory treatment is not something that's done before the dye is put in. Actually, this courage that we need to be practicing is what guides us through music and gymnastics and through the later studies that are going to come in book seven, the arithmetic and geometry and all that, through all of our studies. It's something that guides our whole practice. And Platonism is not a practice of just repeating a mantra, you know. 
So then how do we keep hold of a belief that we don't yet have as knowledge? Well, it's not just that somebody told you this and therefore you believe it. It's that this is a belief that you have come to if you call yourself a Platonist. And it's a it's something that maybe you are maybe early on a person will read these books for the purpose of um testing is this true? Maybe you first you just hold it as a hypothesis that you don't actually believe. But eventually you come to some degree of understanding. I think if a person did not reach some sort of understanding, they would eventually reject it and move on to another system or move on to some other beliefs, you know, other way of thinking, other philosophy or whatever. But if you're a Platonist, it means that you see something in it that seems right to you and this guides you. And this is what's going to keep guiding you. And as you go on, you get a stronger and stronger conviction. Right. So there has to be something drawing you in to begin with. Maybe you did see, have an enlightenment experience and you saw that God was good, mm -hmm. simple, and true. Mm -hmm. um, or many people. many people do, or there's something else, maybe the the logic or the rationality or the culture or mm -hmm. something about the uh, Socrates and these lawgivers mm -hmm. um, drew you to accept a belief that you don't yet have nailed down as understanding or mm -hmm. in your direct experience of knowledge yet. So there's something you have to do to keep hold of that which is not yet yours. Mm -hmm. And the closest I can come to think of is how do you hold on to it? Well, you can pray. That's what religious people do. They, You can sing. In church, we would sing things about what God is. We don't know what God is, but... But even now, like, you know, 30 years later, someone starts a, um, the Our Father song, I can recite the whole thing about the nature of God and reality. And, and it was never understanding or direct experience for me. So a repetition is the only kind of thing I can see that would hold on to a belief that isn't yet yours through direct experience or understanding. Is that what brings you to Platonism? Uh, uh, either a uh, direct mm -hmm. sorry is that what keeps you holding on to the laws I don't know um, <laughs> do you do that yeah I think so I think that's the best I've got um, uh, when the whole world is saying one thing and there's only a very, very small amount of other people saying the other thing. And you don't see it yet. You know that these mm -hmm. people are wise or there's something about them that drew you in, an intuition or something. But, mm -hmm. yeah, it seems to be some sort of repetition to hold on to it and keep convincing yourself. I'm, I'm guessing, unless there's something else that we could do. Mm. Well, let's bring Jacob into it. What do you do? Well, I find with this, like with Platonism, mm -hmm. what keeps me here is that it's a, like a font of knowledge. There's just so much mm -hmm. uh, different texts. Like what, what Jed, Jed said about, you know, a lot of people have a different opinion so if you understand these opinions, there's always someone to uh, convince or talk to about about these. Uh, mm -hmm. Plus, there's just so many texts like we're reading like Numenius and Proclus, and it, it's just an endless uh, supply, like a full lifetime, at least a supply mm -hmm. of just amazing thinkers to. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I like the rational aspect of it every time i come back to it i get some uh knowledge that i didn't have before or you know remembered that i had thought this uh before so uh that's so it's basically. the contemplation that keeps you focused that keeps you coming back and holding on to this and not going in another direction i would say so hmm. 
So not just a repetition, but contemplating it. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It's like a, a repetition of a certain phrase or belief along with the meditative reflective aspect, mm -hmm. contemplating it, integrating it. Yeah. I think there's a theurgic aspect and, um, that maybe you're kind of touching on, but there are different, different systems have different, um, ways of approaching theurgy. Um, there are some systems that just use mantra and repetition and, um, with the theory that the soul will, it will somehow bypass the um, discursive mind and awaken something. And I'm not going to criticize those systems. Maybe there's something to it. But what we do is theurgic in the sense of using the mind. The idea is that um, it we use the mind to know the mind. And so we don't just repeat things but it's a contemplation and a turning in the soul and turning the ideas in the soul and awakening the soul through that turning. And so while maybe in some other systems, mantra or some other kind of repetition could be um, a technique that they use in the development of courage and keeping focused and that it has its place. Maybe if you're a monkey mind and you're experiencing, uh, I see a cat tail. Um, if you're um, experiencing monkey mind and you just want to be focused, something like mantra could focus the mind for that moment. And so it could be a technique that is employed at times, but in general, that's not um, the way Platonists um, do this idea of courage, apply courage in our lives. It's this conviction that we're holding in our soul. And maybe that's where the idea of faith comes in, that we're holding on to it. Um, and maybe early on, you cannot prove it. I mean, and you can never really prove it, but you may, you may be lacking some understanding or even some experience, but it's still, there's something about it that feels right. And there's, and it, it's a, it is a, I think conviction is a good word, that it's a conviction that you hold on to, that there is something about this that's right. And so I want to continue with this and I want to understand it better. And it's that hunger that will keep us going. And it's theurgy that, and, and it has a theurgic um, effect to keep going in this way, that it starts to build and build and build. And that's how gymnastics then ties in very closely with the idea, I think, of courage. That's interesting. See, the reason I picked out mantra is because it has the, repeti the repetition element, which seems mm -hmm. to be necessary if you don't understand it and you're getting it from someone else. Mm -hmm. um, it has the contemplation. A mantra mm -hmm. is something you can repeat, but it's supposed to be repeated during meditation. And it has that devotion um, aspect that you just mm -hmm. raised as well. You wouldn't hold on to a mantra that a guru has given you unless you have some sort of devotion to it or to the godhead of your particular group. And of course, there are stories of um, testing the devotion of an initiate, of making him sit outside the zendo for three days and so on. So that's why I picked out mantra. It seems to have these three elements that we're, when we're honing in on, but it seems to be that the distinguishing feature of this compared to everything else because, hey, you can go down a rabbit hole on YouTube and find people who repeat the same things, are very devoted to their, to their um, belief, and they can find it in their life to prove it and like, oh, I have a direct experience of this or that. It seems the only distinguishing character here is applying it rationally, seeing if we can until we confirm it in our direct experience, which of course you can have in lots of different things, understanding it, reading, talking with friends. So I suppose the thing that was missing from my repetition or mantra is talking with others, 
Yeah, I don't think it's necessary in a discussion of, I think it is, I agree that talking with others um, can be a great thing, but in the discussion of courage, it's not necessarily um, applicable to this discussion because you can hold this conviction without talking to others. Okay, so... So it's uh, repeating something, even though your ups and downs and pleasures and pains and fears and desires say otherwise, holding on to it in some way, um, perhaps through repetition, focus, meditation and devotion, which well, you could... Well, contemplation um, has two different meanings. And so I want to be clear that we're using it the same way, because in many systems, to contemplate is like a deeper meditation. Um, which, and then in the more common sense of contemplation, it's like working through things. And that was more like that came up when um, Jacob was talking about the things that he's reading. And so thinking about them and understanding them and making sense of them and piecing things together, know what this person said and how does it fit with what this person said, that kind of contemplation is like a big part of what we do. Right. And and I think that's missing from the idea of mantra. Right. That was the Although talking with others sort of thing. Like, Reasoning yeah. it out, reflecting it off mm -hmm. your friends, okay. bouncing it off other people. Yeah. You don't have to be, yeah. You don't have to bounce it off someone else, but whether you're bouncing it off your own thoughts or discussing it with others. Um also in the idea of music, working through our states of mind. That's the in our in our modern practice, it's philosophical midwifery um, is our study of a um, big part of our study of music. Yeah, and it certainly can include talking to others, but doesn't have to. But the idea of courage is that conviction that we're holding on to, however we get to it, whether it's talking to others or not. Right. So either talking to yourself, reasoning it through, mm -hmm. or if you're fortunate enough to have another platonic philosopher as a friend, having coffee and talking with him as well yeah it's like that so like the socratic method thing like i find if i can reason about it myself to be much more convinced of it then even if I, someone really smart tells me it i'll mm -hmm. like believe them but until i understand it like mm -hmm. in my own monologue mm -hmm. then i will truly yeah. Yeah, Get for it. me, the talking to myself is the most important part. Talking to others can be interesting as getting giving me something to later talk to myself about. I may get ideas from other people, especially if I'm fortunate enough to talk to somebody very wise who's challenging me and um, giving me a new angle to look at something from. I'm going to then talk to myself, and that's when that's when I personally... Um, work it out. But I think this is also kind of um, an introvert, extrovert thing. I think extroverts tend to work it out by talking to others, whereas introverts tend to work it out by talking to ourselves. That's just my own theory. I'm just throwing it in. But I, it's just personal style anyway. Mm. But in some way or another, we need to work it out. Yeah. It is interesting that all of these elements seem to be a, a refining of things we see in all different places. Like you can take these exact same steps we outlined and apply it to a cult. Some initial uh, um, experience or something charismatic about the person with the beliefs that draw you in, that has to be at the beginning, we talked about that. A sort of, sort of purification, often they purify you of your money. Um, and your friends and family and even your clothes if they want you to wear like the same uniform or Nikes. Um, and then you have to repeat the same teachings over and over again, um, often meditate on it or pray on it or sing about it. And they uh, will like test you with different sorts of pleasures and pains. Normally the cult leader is the one who gets the pleasures, but... Um, that's part of it as well. And they expect you to, uh, to internalize it yourself. They will get mad at you or they will have some tests or, or Dharma combat or something to test if you are uh, uh, have internalized it yourself. In the negative sense, you know, they will 
um, want you to act cultish, but in the positive sense, maybe a, a guru will throw a a, a, a a koan at you or or something to try and roll you up to see if you've internalized the teaching and it's part of you. So it's like what we've just outlined here is the archetype for both the positive or the negative. Mm -hmm. And of course, at the end of it, they promise, well, if you keep this, even though it starts as a belief, if you keep this and you do those things and it becomes your own way of seeing and understanding, then mm -hmm. you get the good thing. In cults, it's, you know, the alien ship will come and take us away or in the modern religions, when you die, you'll get to go to heaven with lots of virgins or whatever. Um, in uh, Eastern spiritual traditions, you will get enlightened, however they explain that. And here, it's the direct uh, experience and, and verification of this teaching through the internal remembering of the wisdom of the true good, simple um, and good, true, simple, and true nature of, of God's self and reality. Mm, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, of yeah. course, you know, the good is always the, um, the model for the bad and the pathologos is the distortion of the logos. And so you can always find that parallel, but we're of course focusing on the healthy and so courage in the true sense. And so we sell wisdom and courage, and um, we have a little time left. We still have about half an hour left, so I'd like to go on to temperance, which again here it's translated as soberness. Um, okay. Before we go on, power, mm -hmm. that seems to be the word that we've, we haven't, that we skipped over. Mm -hmm. What is the power specifically? The power in the soul. What do you take it as? I'll start from there. Uh, Where do you see a mention of power? Sorry? Where do you see uh, the mention of power? Uh, so, for example, on page 357, the definition of courage here, this power in the soul then, this unfailing conservation of right and lawful belief about things to be and not to be feared. What do you think this power is, Jacob? I think it just means like energy. Hmm. Yeah, when you feel a strong conviction, do you feel it as a power? Yes. <laughs> And if you um, if you know yourself to be soul and not the body, then and you know that, like for example, um, just to jump outside this text for a minute here, for example, in the Phaedo, Socrates is, is just before his death, and he's saying he doesn't fear death because he knows he's going to a good place. He knows nothing bad is going to happen. There's no reason to fear death. Only if you identify yourself as body are you going to fear death. Only, only then would you think that death is an end. And so if you don't know what is true, you're going to fear that. But if you have that truth, then you know what is and is not to be feared. To just to pull that out of this um, definition here, things to be and not to be feared. Holding on to that that which holds on that part of you the soul that holds on to that conviction that's a certain power in the soul and that's what i would say he means by power brilliant mindy that's that 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 pull from the other text was so appropriate and touching and brought to light from within me that which would answer that question. That's, I'm gonna to have to give a bit of an, uh, excuse me for, for this. Um, I recently saw an interview where somebody, uh, a really, really smart uh, spiritual guy was having a conversation with another one. And um, the first was talking about enlightenment and how important that was. 
and how it can even be understood and how it's needed for the world. And the second person said, look, without this purification first, without the philosophical midwifery, the, the discovering and, and understanding, finding the root cause and purifying yourself of those false, fundamental false beliefs about self and reality, without that, you're not free. That purification is the starting point of the spiritual quest. Um, I, I referenced uh, Thrasymachus uh, earlier that that I think there's a word like like scholars use uh, aporia or something like that that means an uh, an open, empty ignorance, an awareness that you don't know, but you have purified yourself of false beliefs. But we're talking a more fundamental level. He said, unless you've removed those pathologos views of yourself you carry from childhood, you're not free. You. But then he went on to say, it is true that this experience of enlightenment can diminish the effect of your problems. It can bring you into a certain state of mind that can lessen the effects. It's still there. And of course, there's always a danger that your problems will play out more fervently the more spiritual energy or gymnastics you have behind you. But that enlightenment experience that you mentioned, like in the Phaedo, the separation from the soul and experiencing what it's like to die, mm -hmm. that seems to be the thing that would give you power, energy, to hold on to this, these ups and downs and all these different beliefs from different people mm -hmm. saying all these other things. This experience I have is so powerful and was so real and was so obvious and was I remembering that it was so obvious that I couldn't believe I forgot. That can give you the power. And in this interview, I think that's what he was talking about when he said, absolutely, these through these different yogas and traditions, you can have that experience and it will give you a certain power. But um, it looks like it has to be applied specifically here. That's the difference. If you apply it to this courage with yeah. these laws, with this purification. I would just want to clarify that you don't, it's not, it's not as if courage doesn't begin until you have such an experience. Along the way, like as Jacob was describing, when he's reading things, he'll have little insights and the insights give you that conviction of, oh yeah, this is good. And sometimes, you know, early on, you know, that's enough to keep you going. As you're going from right opinion to understanding, you're going to have a lot of aha moments where you're like, ah, oh, this makes sense. Or, ah, oh, this clicks. And that's what gives you the conviction. Absolutely. It's not an all or nothing. In fact, mm -hmm. that same person has mentioned in the past, these little aha moments are of the same nature of enlightenment. <laughs> it's a matter of building them up, which is why mathematics is such a good practice. Um, not the way it's taught nowadays, but solving a problem where you're puzzled, you have the pieces, and then when you finally can balance the equation, you have a, I get it. He said, that's the same nature as enlightenment. So yeah, these little insights alone or with friends or reflecting <laughs> on your dreams or little... Yeah, uh, mini enlightenments, you could say, build up. And maybe that's the development of a certain kind of power mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you can apply to holding these originally beliefs, but then understanding and then direct experience within your mm -hmm. soul, no matter what. Maybe even beyond this life. Maybe even into your dreams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So now we ready to go on to temperance? Okay. All right. <laughs> Fireworks. All right. Okay, so Jacob, whenever you're ready. All right, Socrates. Two things still remain. To make out in our city soberness and the object of the whole inquiry, justice. Quite so. If there were only some way to discover justice so that we need not further concern ourselves about soberness. Well, I, for my part, neither know of any such way, nor would I wish justice to be discovered first, if that means that we are not 
to go on to the consideration of temperance, so uh, soberness. It's still you. Uh, it's still me. <laughs> but if you desire to please me, consider this before that. It would certainly be very wrong of me not to desire it. Go on with the inquiry, then. I must go on, and viewed from here, it bears more likeness to a kind of concord and harmony than the other virtues did. How so? Soberness is a kind of beautiful order, and a continence of certain pleasures and appetites, as they say, using the phrase master of himself. I know not how, and there are other similar expressions that, as it were, point us to the same trail. Is that not so? Most certainly. Now the phrase, master of himself, is an absurdity, is it not? For he who is master of himself would also be subject to himself and he who is subject to himself would be master. For the same person is spoken of in all these expressions. Of course. But the intended meaning of this way of speaking appears to me to be that the soul of a man within him, within him has a better part and a worse part, and the expression self-mastery means the control of the worse by the naturally better part. It is, at any rate, a term of praise. But when, because of bad breeding or some association, the better part, which is the smaller, is dominated by the multitude of the worse, I think that our speech censures this as a reproach and calls the man in this plight unself-controlled and licentious. That seems likely. Turn your eyes now upon our new city, and you will find one of these conditions existent in it. For you will say that it is justly spoken of as master of itself if that in which the superior rules the inferior is to be called sober and self-mastered. I do turn my eyes upon it, and it is, as you say. And again, the mob of motley appetites and pleasures and pains one would find chiefly in children and women and slaves and in the base rabble of those who are freemen in name. By all means. But the simple and moderate appetites with which with the aid of reason and right opinion are guided by consideration, you will find in few, and those the best born and best ed educated. True. And do you not find this too in your city, and a domination there of the desires in the multitude and the rabble by the desires and the wisdom that dwell in the minority of the better sort? I do. Okay, we'll stop there, but um, there is a little bit more about temperance in the next section, but um, let's, we'll just focus here for now. Um, we got at least the introduction to this idea of soberness or temperance. What we want to do here is he didn't quite give us a direct definition, but he's sort of painting a picture by throwing out some terminology. And if we can collect it together, then we can start to get some sense of what he means by temperance. So I want you to look over the section again and pull out some words that you think are key words that would contribute to the definition of temperance. Or I should call it soberness. He's calling it soberness. Soberness. 
says it bears more likeness to a kind of concord and harmony than the other virtues. Yes. We'll pull out concord and harmony. A kind of beautiful order. Hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. And that that phrase, master of himself. Mm. Good. Which is different than know yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, maybe. I'll just add continence, which is, in this context, self-restraint. Of certain pleasures and appetites. Now there's, now this word, yeah, actually continence maybe brings to mind or maybe helps contribute to why there's a false understanding of what temperance really is. Because I think this idea of self-restraint is the way most people think, their common idea of temperance, is that you deny yourself certain pleasures and appetites. That there's a, a disagreement between what you know to be best for you and what you actually want. And there's this battle, but you restrain that part of you that you think is licentious. That's the common understanding. Um, but we want to push that one aside and see if we can find something else going on here. Um, let me go to the next page here. Yeah, and I think you did a good job pulling out all of the right um, terminology there. Um, let me find this. Um, 31C. Uh, oh, yeah. At the end of this section here, let me see if I can get my cursor to move right. But the simple and moderate appetites with which the aid of reason and right opinion are guided by consideration, um, are guided by consideration, you will find in few in those the best, those the best born and best educated. Stop it here. <clears throat> okay. How does this differ from the common notion of temperance or soberness? So having that simple and, and moderate appetite mm -hmm. means you're not desiring a whole lot you, mm -hmm. you already are keeping it uh simple and moderate mm -hmm. and uh mm -hmm. not many people mm -hmm. have that uh mm -hmm. yeah limit limitness in their right. desires yeah it's easy to desire a lot mm -hmm. yeah Exactly. Yeah, I'm going to come back to this phrase because it actually is ambiguous. If you're holding on to that old definition, that common definition, you can argue that that's what's happening here. That um, reason and right opinion are guiding you by saying, don't do that thing that you most desire. So I think that's where they get this mistake from. I think they would probably cite this very sentence. Although it's actually saying something else, something closer to what Jacob was just saying. So let's go back a bit here. It's a kind of concord and harmony. And it's a beautiful order that creates a, a continence or a certain restraint of these pleasures. You're a master of yourself. If you're constantly arguing and saying, don't eat that cake, are you really a master of yourself? No. The one who is, um, who just naturally is not, dr is drawn to healthy foods 
for example, the very healthy person, if you look at it from like the physical as an analogy here, um, the person who is very fit um, is likely to not want the junky food because it makes you feel bad when you're in touch. Like I do yoga and I can tell you that when you are, when, once you get into a routine of doing some such practice like yoga or Tai Chi or that kind of thing, you start to pay more attention to your feelings. You're more aware of them. You're more sensitive. And if something doesn't agree with your body, you don't want it. It will change the way you think. And that's just on the physical level. I mean, it obviously has its correlates. Um, and those kind of systems are, they fit into the idea of gymnastics, as we were talking about a few weeks ago. So they're more than just physical. But even just on the physical level, we can see that. Becoming master of yourself is about, it's not about arguing with yourself and winning the argument. It's about not having the argument in the first place. And that would tie in with the idea of concord and harmony. Okay. Once next week, we'll get into the next section, which says more about temperance. And so we'll really tie it together better. We're not going to get the full definition here, but we're already starting to get, I think, a sense of what's going on here. This idea of concord and harmony within the soul, the various aspects of the soul. And like, I'm going to actually go to the beginning of the sentence here of concord and harmony, because I think it's important. I must go on, Socrates says, and viewed from here, Sophra soon bears a more likeness to a kind of concord and harmony than the other virtues did. Okay, so it's more about a harmony within all the elements of the soul, all the aspects. Whereas wisdom was dealing with that smallest part of the soul. Courage was dealing with another part of the soul, but now we're looking at a concord and harmony throughout the soul. It's not parts arguing with each other. It's they're functioning together as a concord or a harmony. Okay, and that's what it would mean. And that gives you a beautiful order. When all is focused on wisdom, when you're, when, when you're dealing with a soul, a healthy soul, of course, that's guided by wisdom and has courage in a healthy sense, then this beautiful order, then the, this order in the soul for all the parts to be functioning together, guided by wisdom, would be a beautiful order. And so when you take that to this sentence at the end, I'm going back now to page 361, the simple and moderate appetites, which with the aid of reason and right opinion are guided by consideration, this you find in few. So here we see it's not about reason telling you don't eat that cake or don't um, don't get drunk till you puke. You know, everyone who's been to university or anyone who's actually even if you didn't go to university, anyone who's been a, a teenager in their twenties knows that feeling of uh, the Sunday morning vow to never drink again. Um, but um, that's not what he's talking about here, right? If you have this harmony with the aid of reason and right opinion that's guiding the soul, the appetites will be, um, will fall in line, right, with that, with that wisdom. And that's more of what we're talking about here. Um, we'll see that more clearly when we get to section nine next week. But first, I think that Jed looks like he's deep in thought there, and I really want to hear what he's thinking about. The ending, the ending sentence was interesting because when we were looking at courage, mm -hmm. we pointed out that it's difficult because the many, the rabble, say this and that, and they take pull you in different directions. Um, we talked about how it starts with right opinion, but it's not just right opinion, even held with devotion, like a mantra and in contemplation. We also have to reason about it. Mm -hmm. And ultimately we're doing so with an eye on the direct experience of the good. 
or wisdom. Mm-hmm. So, oh, and by the way, it says at the end of this thing about temperance mm-hmm. that the wise are also few. And we also mentioned that, yeah, the, the people who we're going to get the right opinion from, Plato, Socrates, and people of that ilk, they are very rare. You're more likely to find a, a cult or a religion than you are to find a philosopher who has wisdom to, to start you down this path. So I, I found it interesting that the key elements that we distinguish in courage are also here in this conclusion about temperance. I wonder what that says about this. It's, it's sameness. I'm not sure what you're getting at. I mean, obviously the, the virtues are all, we're looking at, we're looking at virtue from four different aspects, but you can also think of them as one and we're going to see them tied together. You know that. I'm not, I'm not sure where you're going with that. Is there something in particular you wanted to? touch on um reason right opinion separate mm-hmm. from the many um mm-hmm. only able to talk to the very few wise if you're lucky mm-hmm. with an eye on wisdom mm-hmm. those are the things that are the same mm-hmm. and i guess the difference between the two would be I guess the power to do so, we talked about in courage, Mm -hmm. and here is the consequential harmony that results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I I guess for harmony to be harmony, there has to be a a single key or a single root note. Mm -hmm. There has to be a model to which everything is harmonized to. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense that they both, they all have the same goal and even the same kind of process. Yeah, maybe if you think of Socrates as the um, quintessential wise person, right? Plato's presenting him to us as that wise person. He has a certain state of mind and that state of mind we can describe as virtuous, right? That he's, um, he embodies virtue. and. There's one state of mind, but we can pull out these four aspects. We can talk about the wisdom in particular of a person, that that part of him that guides him as the wisdom. And we can talk about that power in the soul that keeps him steadfast, even when he's facing death. That's his courage. And we can talk about that harmony in his soul and call that his temperance. And we haven't yet gotten to justice, but we can pull that out as well and, and call that justice. But it's all one. It's not as if virtue is really four things. It's more like we can see these four aspects within that state of mind. You can you can highlight, depends what your discussion is, what you want to highlight. But as we're talking about temperance, the focus here, of course, Reason still plays its role, and courage still plays its role, and we'll see justice plays its role as well. But when we're talking about temperance, or sophrosun, because many different translations, so when we're talking about sophrosun, what we're focusing on here is that harmony, that beautiful order, the concord in the soul. Right. So with courage, we're talking about one single right opinion about reality one single power that results that allows you to hold on to it no matter what everyone else is saying or the feelings desires for temperance as the one resulting harmonious order of all of the parts and for wisdom it's the have we done wisdom yet or is that to come no we we started with wisdom as the smallest part of the soul that has the one I can go back to that. So that was on page 349. 
It's 365 in the PDF for those of you using that PDF. That was good counsel and, excuse me, good counsel. And the next page, it's defined more clearly as counsel about the city as a whole and the betterment of its relations with itself and other states. The science of guardianship or government. Towards the bottom of the page, he calls it the smallest class, the minutest part of itself, but it takes the lead and rules. Right. Sort of talking about how it functions more than what it is. It's it's, it's ruling. Mm -hmm. It's also small. Yeah. And it's the good counsel of the. Well, it's good counsel. Okay. I guess mm -hmm. we could infer that if courage is the one power and the one mm -hmm. belief that you hold on to, temperance is the one harmonious order. Uh, with the one focus, wisdom could be the one knowing, reasoning, judging, naming, mm -hmm. <laughs> then therefore okay. counseling. Yeah. The knowledge. Counsel about the city as a whole. And that was the key part. It was as a whole. So looking at the soul as a whole. Right. And feeling it and leading. The, the holding of the one knowledge about what is best for the whole of the soul. Mm -hmm. And the other things we mentioned would be uh, what follows, how it uses that, how it functions, how it's small. These are kind of secondary things. But the one part in wisdom is the one apprehension of the ideal whole soul. Mm -hmm. Nice that it's all one um, so we can remember it. Mm. It's all one. Yes. Okay, so why don't we um, stop it there for today. And so then from next time, we will come back to this idea of temperance. And because there is a bit more in the next section, section nine, the first half is on temperance, and then he goes on to justice. So we'll finish up temperance, and then we'll, we'll discuss it. Maybe we'll stop halfway through to discuss temperance, and then we'll go on to justice. Okay, so that's the plan for next week. I noticed um, Jacob's went off mute. Yeah, okay, okay. sorry. Uh, all right. One one thing, though, that uh, question that I'm keeping on this is hmm. way back at the beginning of the Republic, hmm. we had mentioned the they're going like definitions of justice. And I think it was a, that it's like an advantage of the mm -hmm. like stronger over the, mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. weak over the strong. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And and then on this section, so I'm, I'm hoping to get more of an understanding of, of that as, as mm -hmm. we continue through the Republic and get more on to justice. But in temperance, there is, was a line that, you know, uh, that it is justly spoken of as master of itself, if that mm -hmm. in which the superior rules the inferior to be called sober, uh, like, and self-mastered, mm -hmm. temperate. So it just was curious to me that if maybe, maybe justice is the power of the, uh, inferior over the superior then maybe temperance is the opposite the power of the mm. superior over the inferior mm. so I, I don't know if that's yeah i think fair. i mentioned when we were in book one that socrates did not disagree with thrasymachus's definition but he didn't agree with it in the same way that thrasymachus meant it his idea of superior is different and so, yeah, once we take a look at what he calls justice, once we finish book four, it may be interesting then to look back at what Thrasymachus said and see in what way Socrates might agree with him, even though he ultimately rejects what Thrasymachus meant by those terms. What is What does it mean to be superior? What does it mean to be um, the best? And, and, and what is beneficial? What does it mean mm. to, to receive benefit? And so on. So all these words can 
change their definition. Yes, when you look at them um, through Socrates's eyes. Um, but we'll hold that for now. So um, next week, then we're going to go on with temperance. And that was a really good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so next week, then again, we'll finish up temperance and we'll see if we can get through justice or see how far we can get into it. There's quite a bit there. I can guess it's the longer one, the longest one, right? Wisdom was the shortest section and then courage was a little bit longer. Temperance is going to extend into two sections Justice is the longest because that's the one that we're actually focused on here in this dialogue. So those of you watching on YouTube, I do hope that you will join us for that discussion. And as always, if you do have any questions or comments, please put those below. And until next time, so long.